Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you once again for joining us. My name is Adil and I will be your moderator for the webinar as always. Um, welcoming everybody from across the, the across Canada and, and uh, across the world if you are joining us internationally. Uh, we obviously appreciate your interest in the CMBS webinar series uh, and hope to see you again in future webinars as well. A uh, couple of uh, standard announcements. Um, this webinar will be recorded uh, and it will be available and made uh, for free on the YouTube channel. Um, so if you're interested, please do look at uh, this webinar and all of our previous webinars we have have uh, recorded as well. They're all on their YouTube channel. Um, secondly, we, as, as far as the CMBS, we always encourage clinical engineering program, programs to go through a CMB, CMBES peer review. Uh, where we have experts across the approx the spectrum, uh, they come visit your hospital uh, and let you know how your clinical engineering or your biomedical engineering department is doing through our clinical engineering uh, uh, SOP standard uh, operation operating procedures. Excuse me. Uh, so if you are interested, please contact the secretariat. Um, this webinar we're doing in lieu of uh, a conference that we did not have in 2022. Um, so we decided to do, have a series of webinars in lieu of those, uh, but we will be reconvening in 2023, May 16th to the 18th in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. So please make sure to join us then. During the webinar, we will be accepting typed questions and or comments that are submitted through the chat or the Q&A functionality. The panelists will at at their discretion, answer the questions as they come in. However, if you need a, a live response, we will hold that off till the end of the webinar, where we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes, finish, excuse me, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and with that, our topic today is pertaining to the Canadian North. Healthcare technology management in the Canadian North represents a very unique uh, challenge. In particular, extreme environmental conditions, isolated communities, and limited resources. The Northwest Territories and Nunavut have developed uh, a health te healthcare technology management programs to meet the unique needs of the Canadian North. And the two territorial biomedical engineering programs collaborate to maximize knowledge and resources. While the large size and the unique nature of the Canadian North environment poses challenges, the small size of the population and corresponding territorial governments also allow rapid micromodeling of unique health technology management solutions. This webinar will, pre will present an overview of the NWT and Northwest Territory health technology management programs, environment, and unique solutions. Passing it over to Michael to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Adil. Yeah, we have a fascinating topic today and three excellent speakers. I'm pleased to introduce them. <clears throat> First, we have uh, Matt Stacey. Um, Matthew Stacey is a self-employed health technology management consultant who's working with the government of Nunavut, Department of Health. Uh, in this role, uh, Matthew provides the organization with medical equipment planning, project management, procurement, and biomedical engineering leadership and support. He previously worked as an in-hospital biomedical technologist based out of Iqaluit, Nunavut, and Waterville, New Brunswick, before he stepped into a management role overseeing laboratory diagnostic imaging and biomedical engineering services in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. Matthew is an alumnus of the Electronics Engineering Technology uh, Biomedical Program at College of the North Atlantic, St. John's, and received his CBET in uh, 2013. Thank you for being with us today, Matt. <clears throat> uh, our two other speakers. First is Kevin Taylor. Uh, Kevin's the Territorial Manager of Biomedical Engineering for Northwest Territories Health and Societal Social Services Authority. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Previously, Kevin worked uh, the Executive Director of Corporate and Support Services at the foundation of the NTHSSA, much easier to say as an acronym and as the Director of Innovation and Project Management for the Government of the Northwest Territories Department of Health and Social Services. He has also worked in various international biomedical engineering roles in the United States, as well as the United Kingdom's Medical Research Council Laboratories in uh, the Gambia, and also for Orbis International. 
And for those who don't know, Orbis is actually a uh, flying um, eye service, eye surgical services um, uh, plane, which flies around the world. Excellent, excellent um, humanitarian work. Uh, so I think we can all praise folks like Kevin who volunteer their time like that. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, is Anna Ka. We're very uh, glad you're with us today. Uh, she's a health technology planner with the Government of Northwest Territories, Department of Health and Social Services. Uh, she's also with the uh, infrastructure planning team. In this role, she has worked as lead on the research and planning for the procurement of laboratory and clinical technologies for use in the new Stanton Territorial Hospital, as well as regional hospitals and health centers across the NWT. Anna has previously worked as a biomedical engineer with the Medical Research Council Unit, uh, the Gambia uh, Biomedical Engineering Department. Anna is an alumnus of the uh, Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering of the University of Toronto Clinical Engineering Program. She's also an alumnus of the Carleton University Biomedical and Electrical Engineering Bachelor of Engineering Program. So very hearty welcome to all three of our uh, panelists today. Um, I, will I will check, uh, watch for the Q&A. Please, if you do have a question, Type it into the Q and A box. It's down on the bottom um, of your of your banner, and I believe we're going to crew all of those to the end of the talk, and we'll answer as we go along. So, with that, I will pass the uh, floor to Matt. Take it away, Matt. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'm just going to get my uh, screen share up there. Go. Okay. You, everybody see that? Okay, perfect. Well, uh, Ulukut, everybody, uh, good day. Thank you very much for uh, for that introduction, Michael. And um, I definitely want to start by saying thank you to all the attendees today, uh, to Adil uh, and Michael, uh, the CMBES team, for the opportunity to present this topic to everybody. Um, before I get into uh, the presentation, I also want to say a quick thank you to the government and Nunavut uh, Department of Health for supporting the work that I do uh, and for their willingness to share the information I'm going to present to you guys today. Um, so my name is Matthew Stacey uh, and uh, my portion of today's webinar is going to be on health technology management in Nunavut. Um, I'm originally from Carboneer, Newfoundland, so you'll you'll notice a little Newfoundland twang in there at times, and I hope everybody enjoys that. Um, I've been doing contract work for the government and Nunavut Department of Health for about uh, four and a half years now, um, but prior to that, I lived in Nunavut for 10 years and um, bef before I moved to uh, Kentville, Nova Scotia, where I'm located now back in 2018. Um, so between the consulting work and, and being a GN employee, or government and Nunavut employee, um, in total about 15 years working, doing HTM work for, for Nunavut. And so I grew quite uh, attached to the land, the people and, uh, and the work that I was doing. Um, and so as you guys can imagine, I'm super grateful uh, for the evolving work, uh, nature of uh, remote work over the last few years. Um, you know, it's allowed me to continue doing the work that I love and, and still get to connect with some pretty uh, amazing northern colleagues, so like Kevin and, and Anna. Uh, so looking forward to sharing some of this uh, information with you guys, some of the work that we're doing and none of it with you all. all right. um, so I won't spend too much time on this as my title kind of alludes to, um, but I think it's definitely helpful to give everybody some context as we get into um, health technology management specifically in, in Nunavut. Um, Nunavut is it's both the largest and youngest province or territory in Canada. So it's only about 23 years old. Uh, it turned 28 this past April, or excuse me, 23 this past April. It makes up about 20% of Canada's land mass. Uh, so 1.8 million square kilometers. It's, it's a massive, uh, massive area. Population is approximately 37,000 that can vary uh, throughout the year, depending on seasonal workers. Um, but and 84% of those are uh, are Inuit. The uh, the population is spread across 25 communities, uh, divided into three regions. So Kitikmiat in the uh, west, Kivalik region in the central Nunavut, and then the Kikik Tauluk region in eastern Nunavut. 
they all span three time zones, uh, none of which are Atlantic, which is where I am. So uh, my day is usually shifting between uh, four different time zones. Um, they have uh, four official languages, uh, Inuktitut, Inuinaktun, French and English. Um, and you can only access none of the communities by plane. Uh, and depending on the season, you know, uh, you could get by with a snowmobile or dog sled, uh, it, but you got to know what you're doing. Um, but uh, but aircraft, uh, plane is, is the main method of transportation uh, between communities and into none of it. Um, air cargo, though, can be super expensive. So, you know, most heavy, bulky, non-perishable food items, equipment, vehicles, those sort of things are... Uh, typically brought up on, on marine cargo ships or what everyone in none of it refers to as uh, sea lift uh, during the uh, Arctic shipping season. Um, there are no trees in none of it, except for a small part of the territory near uh, the Manitoba border. Um, and that actually encompasses part of Canada's tree line. Um, but uh, I've never actually seen a tree in all of my travels throughout the territory. Um, so there you go. Um, okay, so that's some useful context, uh, and we'll get into what HTM in, in Nunavut kind of looks like. All right, so we can pretty much divide um, HTM services uh, into two categories, right? So it's our regional regionalized core biomedical engineering services. I'll call that core BE services, uh, just to shorten it up a touch and our broader territorial health technology management services. So uh, core BE services are delivered through a combination of internal and external serv service providers um, in the central and western regions, so uh, Katikmiut and Kivalik. Um, we've contracted our core BE services out to the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority, so that's uh, Kevin Taylor's group, and he'll get into some more details on that partnership. Um, the, uh, in none of its easternmost region, or the Kikik Tauluk region, um, core biomedical engineering services are delivered by uh, one in-house BMET and one BMET supervisor that are based at the uh, Kikatani General Hospital in Iqaluit. Um, the team in Iqaluit there are responsible for about 2,500 uh, health technology assets uh, at 11 community health centers and, uh, and the hospital at, uh, in Iqaluit. Um, but with respect to territorial HTM services, so the current organizational structure is such that there, there are no territorial HTM leadership positions. So they don't have uh, a territorial director of health technology or a director of biomedical engineering. So that's kind of where my uh, HTM consultant role comes in. Um, so I collaborate and coordinate with the regional and territorial leadership teams um, and with, uh, with our core biomedical engineering teams. Um, but mainly my time is, is, is heavily focused on health technology planning, procurement, and uh, either managing or contributing to various health technology uh, projects that are going on throughout the territory. Uh, so as HTM professionals working in some of Canada's uh, most northern remote and isolated communities, we sometimes need to consider uh, some pretty complex human resource, uh, geogra or, um, excuse me, geographical and environmental challenges that are common in, in Canada's Arctic. So I'll try to use the next couple of slides to uh, highlight some of Nunavut's HTM-led uh, projects that kind of try to address some of those challenges. All right, so uh, medical equipment standardization. Um, I'm sure you're all really familiar, you know, everybody on this call is familiar with why standardization is, is a good thing. Um, I will say, though, that in the Nunavut context, with um, pretty significant human resource constraints, the geography, right, um, and some pretty unique logistics and supply chain challenges, um, the positive impacts that we get from standardization are, are really amplified in, in terms of uh, efficiencies that we can generate within the healthcare system. So uh, medical equipment standardization has been very, very important to, uh, to none of it. Our primary mechanism for standardization is our Territorial Procurement Committee. Um, and it's composed of a multidisciplinary membership from right across the territory. Um, and they're all tasked with uh, reviewing and approving standard, uh, standard medical equipment consumables um, right across the territory. Um, there are a couple drivers that you know, really accelerated our standardization process. 
Um, and the first was none of its membership in a group purchasing organization or GPO. Uh, so none of it's actually a member of the health pro uh, GPO. And, and to be honest that, you know, that membership allowed us to really streamline our equipment selection, procurement processes. Um, what we tend to do now is focus uh, more on devices that are available through the GPO contracts first. Um, and if they align with uh, the clinical need and our greater standardization initiative, chances are they'll end up getting approved. So um, that'll, you know, that saves us an incredible amount of time and energy on procurement and equipment selection um, tasks. Uh, the second driver really was our standard equipment catalog. And uh, you'll see a, an excerpt of that to your right um, it's really helped drive acceptance of standardization like within the department. Um, and so we document all the uh, equipment that gets approved by the Territorial Procurement Committee in this catalog. And it includes things like, um, you know, so this is a vital signs monitor. It'll have our standard configuration of vital signs monitor. Um, and it lists all the consumables and accessories, product numbers, and, and even prices. Um, so, and, and what we found was that, you know, if we give this to frontline staff, um, have, they have easy access to it. I would like to think it's somewhat visually appealing. Um, and it, and it, it's actually really helped with compliance of standardization. So we, we tend now not to really have to buy uh, or deal with buying uh, three or four different vital signs monitors. So it's really helped in that regard. <clears throat> now, this one, you know, I think if I was to tell or say what my what project has really meant the most to me over my career, I think it would certainly be the basic radiological technician or BRT training program. Um, basic x-ray services are considered a mission critical requirement at all health centers in Nunavut. And so um, having a high quality service available, um, it improves patient care and really drives some significant uh, savings in medical travel related costs. Um, we found that the best way to provide these services was through investing in the department's Inuit employees. Um, so we partnered with the Ontario Association of Medical Radiation Sciences uh, to develop a BRT certification program, which focuses on uh, teaching basic x-ray skills uh, within a pretty limited scope. Um, but you know, by training our Inuit employees as BRTs um, and, and giving them the tools that they needed to provide these services in their own communities, we found that um, quality, consistency, and sustainability of the x-ray service improved right across the territory. Um, you know, another major benefit of, uh, of this program and investing in our Inuit uh, employees um, was that it promotes a specialized delivery or specialized healthcare services delivered uh, by Inuit for it. And, and I mean, that is, that is quite significant because um, it enables BRTs to provide uh, much more culturally appropriate care, um, which in turn, you know, it, it improves the patient experience and, and ultimately uh, improves health outcomes. Um, so to the left is a picture of Mary Gabby Padlock. She's a, uh, a uh, recent graduate of the BRT program from Kimroot, Nunavut. And uh, that picture there was featured uh, in a recent uh, Department of Health territorial newsletter. Um, her supervisor describes her as the oil uh, to the machine of the health center. And, and you'll notice she received a pretty awesome cake there, uh, radiology themed cake, uh, with her BRT certificate at a local graduation ceremony that they held for at the health center. Um, you know, I think that picture alone, uh, quite, it speaks quite a lot to the, to the pride that her and her colleagues, um, especially whoever made that cake, uh, feel about her achievement and, and the work that she does for her community members. So uh, really grateful to have been involved with that program and, and for the positive impact that um, the BRTs are having on the ground and none of it every single day. Okay, uh, so molecular COVID-19 testing. Um, the initial months, you know, everybody knows the COVID-19 pandemic was like an incredibly challenging time, I think to put it mildly for, uh, for everyone uh, in our global community. And, and none of it was no exception. Um, in March, 2020, I was asked by our uh, chief public health officer to 
bring COVID testing to Nunavut as soon as you can. Um, and, and we really had to start from scratch because um, we didn't have any existing equipment or resources that, uh, that we needed to develop an in-house test. Um, so like, like a bunch of uh, labs did in the South. So we, we formed a multidisciplinary working group and uh, had to really quickly assess uh, the complex testing technology landscape in the country um, at that time, which was kind of crazy. Um, and, and try and determine which devices uh, would be suited in Nunavut's environment and those that were approved and we could actually get our hands on. Um, so there was a lot of different variables going on there. It was a really interesting time. Um, we built relationships with other provincial and territorial public health labs and, and the teams at the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg uh, to help support our efforts. And, and those, re those relationships really proved to be extremely valuable. Um, and, and I got to say the, the, uh, the amount of collaboration and, and really goodwill that I saw between, you know, these public health labs, the federal government and, and Northern remote and isolated communities was quite, it was actually quite inspiring to be honest. Um, there were a lot of really long days and months, but, uh, within the first four months of project initiation, we had lab based capacity in two of our three regional laboratories, and we followed that by rolling out uh, molecular point of care uh, COVID testing in, in all 25 Nunavut communities within about 11 months of project initiation. So we were really proud of that. Um, I have to say, you know, and, and this has really been one of the most fascinating um, learning experiences of my career for sure. Um, this picture here on the, uh, on the right is uh, of a good friend of mine and the manager of the lab at the Kikatani General Hospital in the Callaway. Her name's Kim Dion. Um, we had worked together for about 18 months on this particular project, uh, and and I was finally able to. Uh, after that, I was finally able to uh, visit a Callaway uh, after the travel restrictions were lifted and and uh, meet with Kim. And she very graciously presented me with this uh, Lab Week 2021 T-shirt. Um, says uh, skilled enough to work in a lab and crazy enough to love it. Um, so I know, you know, this kind of sounds a little silly, but like that t-shirt, it really, it, it meant a lot to me. And, it, and I, I kind of felt like I had paid my dues and, and kind of been accepted into, uh, into the lab world. Anyway, um, just really grateful, uh, you know, for all those lab public health and materials management people that, uh, that really deserves some recognition and, and helped us get out of a pretty, pretty rough patch there. So thanks to all of them. Okay. So, uh, that's the end of my part. I just, I'm going to finish up with a quick pitch. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see the picture at the bottom of the, uh, the slide here is, uh, that's actually the Kikitani general hospital in a Um, and to the right up here is our, uh, our permanent biomedical engineering technologist, uh, Jildes Fatso. He's just uh, freshly out of the operating room and uh, hanging out at the shop at QGH. Um, but I mean, if you're if you're a biomed, uh, a technologist, and or you know of somebody who might be looking for a challenge uh, or, or an opportunity to experience a, a different culture, you want to use your skills and and experience in some pretty unique places that not a lot of people get to actually visit. Um, you know, definitely consider giving none of it a shot. Um, I think. You know, if you have a positive attitude, um, if you have respect and curiosity for other cultures, an ability to kind of roll with the punches, um, work independently, and you have a bit of an adventurous side, um, this might be just the opportunity you're looking for. So um, I'm practicing my sales skills, as you guys can tell. Um, but there's uh, so we have permanent and casual BMET and uh, supervisor opportunities available. Great salaries and some other financial incentives like our Northern Living Allowance and subsidized staff housing. Um, I've also included the link to the government of Nunavut's uh, public job postings website and my email address is there. So um, if there's anyone out there that is uh, that would like to talk to me about uh, or reach out directly about working or, or living in none of it, I'm, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So reach out. Um, and then I'll, I'll just finish by saying this, that, you know, after 10 years of, of living in none of it and about 15 working for them in total, I can tell you with 100% sincerity that um, it's definitely a place where I 
I truly feel like the work that I do makes a difference. And, um, and that goes a long way for me and uh, it keeps me coming back. At least it has for the last 15 years. So um, anyway, uh, with that, Kleonami, thank you. And uh, I'm happy to hand it over to my good friend and Northern colleague, Mr. Kevin Taylor. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me just see if I can get my screen shared here correctly. Oh, wrong one. Hello, uh, I'm Kevin Taylor. I'm the Territorial Manager of Biomedical Engineering. And before I start, uh, I want to highlight the fact uh, that I'm speaking to you from Yellowknife, uh, which is the traditional lands of the Yellowknife uh, Dene uh, on Chief Drygee's territory. Uh, between Nunavut and the NWT, uh, we are essentially presenting on what, like I, what I like to call as biomedical engineering on the edge. I do encourage uh, any biomed techs uh, who are retired or looking at retirement to get a hold of Matt. Uh, the experience in in Nunavut is exceptional. You have to be flexible. I had a tech recently whose flight got canceled in Rankin Inlet, and uh, she was offered a uh, to share a uh, heated container in the airport parking lot uh, because there was no hotel rooms. Uh, the The nurses in the health center were able to accommodate her, but uh, yeah, you have to be flexible. But I really encourage people. In fact, my techs, even with experiences like the one I just mentioned, uh, generally thumb wrestle for who gets to go to Nunavut. It's stunningly beautiful. The people are exceptional and it is an amazing experience. Uh, so if anybody's a retired biomed tech or you have time and you would be interested in the experience, I really encourage you talking to Matt. He, I, he, he uh, uh, will uh, give people short-term contracts and things like that to meet the needs there. Um, so, uh, uh, again, the northern environment is unique and it's a lot of fun. And we're going to be presenting on the Northwest Territory side of that. Uh, I'm going to present on Biomedical Engineering Program for the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority. As uh, Mike's, uh, Michael said, that's a mouthful. So we'll probably refer to it as NTHSSA, which is the acronym. I'll give you a quick overview of the scope of coverage of our, and our demographics. Uh, and uh, I'll give you, uh, then I'll talk about the development of the biomed program in the NWT and how we are uh, sustaining an advancing health technology management program for in the Canadian North. And I'll wrap up with a summary of some of our ma recent major initiatives. Uh, my presentation is going to focus on the operational uh, side of health technology management as Anna Ka will be presenting after me on the Department of Health and Social Services Health Technology Replacement Planning side of HDM. Uh, this slide uh, gives you kind of a sense of the immense geographic area covered by NTHSSA's Biomed program. Biomedical engineering services supports all the NWT and as Matt mentioned, two thirds of uh, Nunavut territory. I'm not 100% sure uh, but I think this is the largest geographic area covered by an in-house biomed program in the world. Russia, if there is one, might beat us, but I'm pretty sure this is the largest. And that's done with seven techs. So it's pretty impressive. And it's, again, it's a unique environment and a lot of fun. Some really quick demographics. The NWT consists of 33 communities, 40% of which are fly-in only, which are logistically supported by ice roads in the winter or barge in the summer. In the case of Nunavut, we support the Kibbalik and Katikmiut regions, which Matt mentioned, and there are 13 communities there that are only fly-in, and they have barge in the summer for logistics. Uh, getting to these communities can take up to two days of travel, assuming thing, everything lines up in terms of flights and weather. You need to be really flexible, as I mentioned at the start, uh, in the north, but it's always an adventure. There's always something amazing and interesting to see. Uh, for example, a while ago, I was stuck in Saks Harbor, a community of less than 100 people up in the high Arctic for five days due to fog. And at the same time, I couldn't really go and walk around the town since there was a polar bear in town. Uh, even driving in the, to the communities can be an experience. 
uh, traveling for two hours on an ice road on the mighty Mackenzie and 24 hour darkness is quite interesting. Uh, or getting stuck behind a herd of buffalo, and this happened to me for one hour whilst they wandered down the road uh, uh, yeah, when then finally decided to get off the road. Beeping at them doesn't work. Um, so it's again an amazing environment. Uh, and uh, the scenery is staggering oftentimes, aside from the unique challenges that uh, biomed technology brings. So biomedical engineering uh, was started in the mid-90s as an in-house program. Prior to that, uh, they purchased third-party remote support out of Alberta. When it first started, the program consisted of one biomedical engineering technologist working out of an electronics repair shop. And at the time, they kind of grew to support about one half the communities and facilities. In the late 90s, early thousands, a biomedical engineer was hired to create a full health technology management program. And by 2005, there were four BMETs and one biomedical engineer. And this was the case until about 2018. In 2016, uh, the government of the Northwest Territories uh, hired uh, for about a half a million dollars a consultant uh, to tell us that having seven separate health authorities for 45,000 people was not sensible. So they created the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority, um, uh, which merged most of them together. Biomedical engineering uh, was already a territorial service, so we didn't have a whole lot of adjustment to do. Uh, unlike other areas where it was a rather significant adjustment, our only major change was organizational and biomedical engineering became part of the newly created informatics and health technology division under corporate and support services. In 2018 to 2022, the biomedical engineering pro program grew from uh, four techs to seven techs. A complete inventory and assessment was also done in 2018-19 to ensure the biomed database tracked all health technologies, not just the ones we supported and serviced, but all health technologies. The biomed database now tracks over 7,500 health technology assets for the Northwest Territories support, and biomedical engineering uh, supports in-house everything from pulse oximeters, including anesthesia, ventilators, dialysis, and community extra units. The expansion of the database uh, to cover all health technology assets um, uh, allowed biomedical engineering to successfully take over the budgeting and management of all health technology service contracts for the territory with the goal of consolidating them and properly starting to manage them. Uh, for example, prior to that, um, uh, for one company's x-ray contracts, we had actually 15 separate contracts with 15 separate start dates and 15 separate terms and conditions. And we were able to consolidate that into a single agreement. To support all this work, the backbone of the system is the Territorial Health Technology Management Database, which I just managed, mentioned, and it's the accruent TMS platform. We've uh, uh, worked together, Matt and I, and we've expanded that tool and it's shared with Nunavut. Most important, the Biomed database is recognized by the government of the Northwest Territories as the source of truth for the territory for all health technology assets and tracks not only the work history and asset details that are needed for the technologists to do their job, but also uh, contracts, replacement costs, condition. Consequently, the data is able to be mined and we use it, the medical equipment replacement score system to prioritize replacement of health technology. Since 95% of all health technology service contracts are directly managed and supported by biomedical engineering, we are able to consolidate them and leverage the savings we can create in their management. This has allowed us to cancel some contracts taking the work in-house and or find savings that were reinvested in factory training. For example, recently two staff went on fixed x-ray room training, which will bring a number of rooms in-house and save about $50,000 per year, uh, which can then be used for additional factory training as well as purchasing test equipment. Another example uh, in, is just this week, we'll be having first call training on laboratory coag analyzers uh, from a third party service vendor. This is an interesting example um, of the success of the biomed management of the contract. We went to a third party uh, service vendor since biomed took over the contract and consolidated the four separate contracts together. We noticed that the OEM refused to honor the terms of the original purchase agreement and the contract and was charging us an excessive excessively for their non-compliance. We have four analyzers in the territory 
with a purchase cost of $55,000 each. And the OEM was charging us when we consolidated it $75,000 per year for the privilege of using their contract. We now have the, con using third party, we now have the contract down to $40,000 per year. And with the first call training that's happening, we anticipate to lower that further. All NWT biomed techs within two years normally get factory service training on dialysis, anesthesia, ventilators, mobile x-ray, and physiological monitors as a core. I say normally because COVID deferred a significant amount of training and we're now catching up. Uh, but, and to maintain the competence over all these specialty areas, biomed techs rotate as lead uh, on an annual or biannual basis between the specialty support areas. Also, all health technology purchases that are not part of Evergreening are done, which is done by the Department of Health and Social Services, are coordinated by biomedical engineering to ensure standardization. There's a surprising little resistance on the part of the clinical users to biomed taking this role, and it has made it easier uh, by the Department of Health. It's made a lot easier by the Department of Health biomed experts putting standing offer agreements in place. Uh, we we kind of took on this role and just kind of kept it uh, during COVID. Uh, in the first month of COVID, uh, working together with the Department of Health, uh, we spent the entire, more than the entire year's capital budget in one month and had to income inspect all that equipment and get it in place. So it was quite an experience. So to wrap up, I'll give a quick summary of some current initiatives. Uh, starting in 2018, Matt and I established a bi-weekly meeting with Nunavut and the NWT. This meeting was set up to align all of Nunavut and the Northwest Territories health technology policies and procedures for the purposes of meeting accreditation and ultimately led to the creation of our existing partnership agreement, which was in place in 2022, as well as the sharing of the health technology management database. Uh, that partnership agreement is a cost recovery agreement, so we're not making a profit off of Nunavut, and they're always able to take that work back in-house if they wanted to, and they were able to. Uh, so it's not a control, the NWT controlling the service in the Nunavut, it's a complete partnership, and Matt contributes expertise and resources to us on a regular basis as well. But also growing out of that bi-weekly meeting, Nunavut and the NWT have set up a tri-territorial calls with UConn. And we're entering into discussions with them on how we can work together, even if it's just sharing advice and support. For example, during COVID, uh, UConn shared their experience and solutions for managing oxygen shortfalls during the COVID wave. This insight was passed on to the facility experts at uh, the Stanton Territorial Hospital and allowed us to successfully manage the cl collapse of our O2 concentrator system during the Delta wave. So we would have been in a really bad way if they hadn't shared that knowledge because we were able to actually have a lot of uh, elements prepped. We also continue to consolidate all service contracts with the goal of looking at multi-year, multi-vendor savings. Although just uh, three weeks ago, uh, I found out about the Canadian Medical Equipment Protection Plan entity, and they it looks like they would be able to basically give us a single agreement that would manage 80% of our contracts and essentially short track about three years of worth of work for me. So I'm looking into that with a lot of interest and I don't know if anybody else is familiar with them, but I encourage, encourage you to look at their website. Uh, also the NWT is actively involved in the CMBS right to repair strategy. Uh, the CEO of NTHSSA, and this is our ability to micro model really easily because it's not very hard to put in a, a territorial policy in place, a provincial policy in place. Uh, and the CEO of the NTHSSA authorized our new territorial health technology management policy, which has right to repair in it set as mandatory requirements in any health technology purchase. We also have been working with the Department of Health Biomeds and we have drafted RFP and RFT terms and conditions to align with this policy's right, right to repair requirements. We are more than happy to share these policies and procedure documents with anyone who's interested. And in fact, I'd want feedback if I share them with you. And then finally, working with the Department of Health, where we've created and maintained the Territorial Health Technology Management Committee. And this is a territorial level committee recognized by our CEO and, uh, and uh, co-chaired by myself and the, uh, the manager of health technology planning at the Department of Health. And it it has the mandate to set up uh, a multi-year health technology replacement plan and also a standardized health technology 
uh, standardized uh, recommendations for all health technology models and the uh, uh, device models in the territory. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation over to my colleague, Anna Kaw, who will present to you on the Department of Health and Social Services Technology Planning Division. Thanks, Kevin. I will start sharing my screen. There. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna. Um, I'm speaking from Yellowknife myself and uh, uh, working with the health technology planning team here uh, for the NWT. I will be uh, talking about the Department of Health and Social Services um, The Department of Health and Social Services Health Technology Planning, um, which is uh, a part of the GNWT. And in our infrastructure planning division, uh, we have a, a manager for the HTP team and three health te technology planners. Right now we're down to two. Um, ideally, we would have uh, four plus admin support. So like Matt, I am uh, Shouting out to anybody who wants to come up here and work with us, you're more than welcome. As part of the IP division, uh, our team plans and procures health technologies for health facilities across the Northwest Territories. And um, we are part of the broader IP team, uh, which is composed of uh, facility planning consultants and infrastructure planners who are made up of engineers, architects, and designers. So what we do um, is very, uh, we work hand in hand with the NTHSSA uh, biomedical engineering team, that's Kevin Taylor's team. And what we do uh, is planning for the replacement of medical equipment as they approach their end of life. And uh, that includes uh, doing the research, technical requirements, um, regulatory requirements, doing the user consultations, um, for various projects. So each health technology planner manages around five to six projects annually. And uh, we have a bit of overlap with Biomed as Kevin Taylor talked about, uh, depending on the type of technology we're talking about, uh, we may be the leads uh, doing the installation, commissioning and user training uh, components of it, and then handing it over to the NTHSSA, whether it's biomedical engineering or facilities management. So for planned replacement, uh, that includes uh, the front end uh, working on a project and then moving on to the procurement process that that's the procurement exercise doing the documents, whether it's an RFP, RFQ, um, and working with our procurement division of the GNWT, we'll put together the documents, hand it over to them. And then what they do, they post it and give it back to us. And as the experts, we do the bid evaluations and contracting uh, to the vendor, the successful bidders, and then work with the, with the vendors uh, uh, moving forward. So our team uh, gets, we have two, two types of funding. So we have a larger budget, uh, that's the capital fund uh, for high value uh, system replacement projects. So such as DI systems, physiological monitoring systems. Uh, this is more structured and uh, is approved on a five-year planning cycle. Currently we are in year one of the cycle. Our o and fund is a lower value fund for smaller projects. So whether it's lab centrifuges or cast cutters, um, the items are prioritized annually. So we use the MER score, that is the medical equipment replacement scoring system that Kevin talked about earlier as well. Um, we use the Biomed database as a data source. So we do data mining, um, figure out what to prioritize on an annual basis. So our uh, project planning team also does new technology requirements, new builds, 
uh, new programs. And of course, the pandemic was uh, something that came as a challenge to us. And I believe our team rose to the, to the occasion and worked very closely with the NTHSSA and other uh, stakeholders to um, provide support with the procurement uh, of that. Like I said, approximately our team has 15 to 20 projects a year. And this includes health facility renovations because um, depending on the type of technology, then the project may become a double project. And then what that means is not only do you have to work on replacing the equipment, you have to provide um, uh, the new looks, for instance, an example I have here on the two images on the right is for the uh, hematology systems that we had to put in Hay River Health Center. Um, we had to find a new location for the system because of uh, constraints in uh, space in the lab, uh, provide uh, power to that new location, provide network and drain drainage for the system. This also, because we're doing renovations in a healthcare facility leads to infection prevention and control measures that need to be taken. Um, and also another separate construction contract. So uh, our projects can be uh, a little bit challenging, but very exciting. So like Matt and Kevin alluded to, um, we have our unique challenges for working up here. Uh, we have high turnover of staff, clinical staff, our own staff. Um, it's also a challenge to include those service requirements that we need for contracts um, that also recognize our logistical challenges. So we try to include those in our procurement documents upfront when we're purchasing um, new systems. Um, there's challenges to freight log logistics, um, making shipments complicated. There's also road access uh, issues, depending on the type of year. Many communities are flying only, and that has its own limitations because of size and weight limitations on airplanes. Um, some equipment such as fridges and freezers with certain types of uh, refrigerants are not supposed to be transported on planes, so we have to find alternatives. It limits what we can get for our communities up here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can give some examples of projects that uh, we've worked on in our team here, uh, the most notable being the Stanton Renewal Project, um, of which uh, we had 90, more than 90 procurement packages um, over four years. And what we uh, worked on, what I personally worked on included um, biological safety cabinets, uh, fume hoods, laminar flow units, um, uh, the images, uh, the image here shows the boom. So um, this is uh, an image of the um, OR, I believe. Uh, so it was a significant uh, time for our team as well prior to COVID. And then we have also worked uh, in the past uh, procurement cycle on doing the dialysis equipment for Stanton Territorial Hospital, which is the largest hospital here in Yellowknife, uh, Hay River. And we aligned the dialysis equipment uh, with the Alberta Kidney Care North, uh, just so that uh, we can have training and support across the board from Alberta to our uh, systems up here, our services up here in Yellowknife and across the Northwest Territories. Uh, the Infant Warmers uh, project as well, um, we worked on for, it was an o &M project, so not capital, uh, was for various NWT communities. We had some logistical challenges to overcome for that. Uh, thanks to Kevin Taylor and his team as well, we were able to finish those a few weeks ago. Um, the endoscopy uh, system we also did uh, last year, completed it this year. Um, it's a multi-year project, so some of our projects do work like that. We have multi-years, uh, uh, do some communities a certain, a certain year and others a certain year. Um, so th those were done for three sites. Uh, we upgraded the scopes to high definition scopes uh, featuring new AI technology features that the, that the um, end users loved. Uh, so personally, I worked on the tubs and lifts and hematology uh, projects. Um, 
These are uh, bath tubs and bath lifts used uh, in the long-term care facilities. So sometimes we also have to do planning and procurement for those. Um, the long-term care facilities needed these new lifts um, in 2020, which coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we also had um, installation and training uh, challenges that we had to overcome for that. And uh, the facilities management teams of the different uh, healthcare facilities had to um, do their own installations at that point. And uh, that's another challenge that we had to overcome. And we just finished uh, this project this year, actually. So from 2020 to now, two years of that. The hematology I touched upon earlier, um, having that uh, architectural implications for a project, making it a double project, and then having to do the infection control stuff on it as well. So our current uh, and upcoming projects include mammography, anesthesia, clinical chemistry, uh, laboratory, fridges and freezers, and some upcoming ones are the physiological monitors and fetal monitors. An example, a uh, capital project that we're working on right now is mammography. We're doing two out of three sites. So that's for Stanton here in Yellowknife, Inovec, and uh, the third being uh, Hay River is actually off cycle, so it's not at its end of life just yet, so it's not part of the process. We are doing an RFP uh, to make sure that uh, we give bidders an opportunity to propose solutions to our challenges that we have with service training. And again, with the high staff turnover, we have locums that come up here from Alberta to provide services for these, and we want to make sure that our locums are familiar with the systems that we have. The anesthesia machines uh, are another project that we're working on. There are seven across Stanton, Inuvik, and Hay River. Replacement challenge for us uh, is the constraint that we have on oxygen input to the system. So unlike uh, facilities in the south, uh, up here we have uh, oxygen concentrator plants and the and the type of oxygen that we have is uh, anywhere somewhere between 95 to 98%. So it limits the type of uh, anesthesia machine that we can have up here. And that drives what our procurement um, choice becomes. So whether it's an RFQ or an RFT. So for clinical chemistry, again, uh, because of where we are in the North, we have uh, a current standard in the territory to have dry chemistry and that's what we continued with. The current project uh, that I'm working on is in the second year of a three-year project and uh, the priorities that we have is to make sure that we have we continue with the dry chemistry system because like I said infrastructure for wet chemistry doesn't exist and um, that change cannot really happen for us so we standardize to dry chemistry. Uh, the lab and pharmacy fridges and freezers, I talked about this a little bit, so because of uh, how uh, our communities are remote and things have to be flown in, we uh, are a bit limited on what we can get for our different communities, but we are using an RFT process or request for tender. And uh, what we're hoping to do with this project is to have an SOA and standardize to two platforms that are currently in the territory. So not changing that, that standard. Um, and then with an SOA, which is a standing offer agreement, uh, not only the department, but the different sites can use the SOA and make their own orders on equipment that they need. So there is an agreement on pricing between us and the vendors and they can use that pricing. And if it's, um, if it's a site that's outside the seven that we have on the SOA, they'll just have a separate uh, invoice for shipping. So a challenge for this project, again, is the logistics of shipping to all the communities. So our upcoming projects are uh, the physiological monitors, which is going to be a big one for us. Uh, we have projected it to 
start somewhere in 2024, 25. So planning for it is next year, 2023, 24 fiscal year. Five communities, mostly Stanton Territorial Hospital has most of these uh, instruments. Um, the, these are system replacements that would have both bedside and telemetry monitoring systems. And another exciting one that I that I uh, hope to work on in the coming year, uh, fiscal year 2023 24, is the fetal monitors. So, thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, I look forward to answering them. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, that, was, that was, again, all presentations. Fantastic, very informative, um, lots to learn from. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We do have about three minutes for questions. Again, we can go a bit over if that's all right. Um, I, I know we had a couple of things that we probably wanted to discuss uh, uh, as per some of the questions that were asked. So uh, if anyone does have a question, again, please utilize the Q&A feature uh, and or the webinar uh, chat if, if everyone likes. I know there's a, uh, Kevin, I think what you mentioned to previously relate to those policies, seems like there was a bit of interest in in some policies uh as well so uh maybe we can work out if uh how we uh, if they can potentially reach out to the secretariat and we can sort of forward them on or or you can contact them directly i think that's perfectly fine as well i'll tell you a, a, a little follow-up uh, one that i'm hoping kevin and i can kind of push forward and then maybe in a future webinar we can even talk about it is um, Kevin's paper that he wrote on the MERS uh, dates from 92, I think, from Clinical Journal of Clinical Engineering. Um, 2002, I think, but yes. And, and I adapted very long actually, time ago, Michael. Very I, long I, I adapted ago. that for, uh, for Nova Scotia. We've been using that for like 10, 12, 15 years. I forget what it is. Uh, and I'm hoping, CARS kind of derailed us, but I'm hoping to get back to CARS MERS 2.0 um, to really... Uh, revamp those uh, because um, Kevin's program and the one that we've been using, it's a really good kind of pre pre processing of your hundreds upon hundreds and therefore hundreds of millions of dollars worth of submissions uh, really near, uh, focuses you in on a very difficult problem. Yeah. Uh, and we do have, as um, Adil mentioned, we do have a number of questions and whatever we can't get to during the session, we'll, we'll do as much on follow-up as possible. Um, one of the ones that Jennifer McGill had asked, um, I wanted to go back to it, the, the right to repair wording. We're actually working on that as a, as a national CMBS committee right now. Um, so that's actively um, in progress. And uh, we're actually matching it. We're trying to keep an eye on the bill as it goes through its reading and revisions uh, and search, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's very much, uh, stay tuned. We, that's, that's very much uh, in progress. Um, there was another one that I was suggesting that we could talk about to get, oh yes. Um, Kevin, you wrote, an, uh, you wrote a response to Ishtar, but I wonder if we open it up to all three of you. Do you have any lessons learned that you might want to share with, uh, with the folks on, on the line? Yeah, lesson learned in terms of uh, what? So you've been working um, in the North for a number of years. Um, anything you would do differently? Um. Yeah, well, it's continual learning experience up here. Um, the primary item that you have to be is mentally flexible. The physical environment is such that often, even times, national standards actually can sometimes pose a risk rather than a uh, benefit. So you have to be extremely careful about how you uh, look at problems. It's not just cookie cutter, which is often in the case in the South. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to figure out where the problem actually is. Um, sometimes uh, we have bad power. We have uh, extremely dry, extremely dry, like 0% humidity. So certain items wear out faster than you would anticipate and things like that. So there's a lot of little unique things. So I guess the best lesson learned that I have is the need to be uh, mentally flexible 
around problem solving. Yeah, um, and I think Ishtar, when he asked that question, Michael, he was uh, even got specific about the like lessons learned on the standard catalog. So, um, yes, so that's my standard equipment catalog. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and I think honestly, the, I mean, I I love that catalog. Don't get me wrong. It took me a lot of time to do it, but um, it's it's a little bit too robust to be honest with you. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it needs, so right now I've probably got 130, 140 pages in this thing. I mean, it's beautiful to look at, but, um, you know, it, it's not, it's becoming so large now that it's almost not as functional as it should be. So I think with respect to that, um, that's probably a lesson learned on it. I'm going to try and shrink it down a little. There you go. Anna, you mentioned a number of uh, very interesting projects that you've uh, worked on. What are some of the uh, uh, fun and interesting things that you've learned that maybe you'd approach slightly differently now with a little bit more wisdom? Um, one thing I can say is uh, it's very useful to be um, out there at the different facilities and communities to get to meet the people that we're working with. Um, with what I do here, there is some travel involved, but not as much as I would like to, like Kevin is going out there. And um, what I have learned is being there in person and seeing um, the challenges that uh, the different users have with equipment um, being able to see their spaces um, and see what, like I talked about the hematology project in Hay River, um, not only is it a challenge to to have the equipment in place, but there's other structural and 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 which you can only know if you're there in person. So that's that's another thing I can add. Yeah, you got to walk the road. Yeah, <laughs> I, I very much understand that. And actually, with that in mind, there was a question which I left open on purpose in the chat. Um, Jack Edubaka was asking about some materials to help with dialysis facilities design, etc. That's a pretty loaded question. I don't think we want to handle that um, during with this like tight format. So, Jack, I would encourage you, please, can you forward your contact information? And why don't we start a group conversation? Because you probably we probably want to mine even more than just from northern groups or like even one side of the group. I think there's probably a little group of a group of us that you want to speak with before you just kind of take that and run with it. Um, I have a quick question. Anna, you use the term RFT which I've actually never used before. I mean, there's a lot of different acronyms flying around, people that have different flavors. Um, but can you maybe think about, or talk about when you would, in your Northern context, because I find this quite fascinating, when you would leverage, say, an RFT, request for tender, versus uh, what we would call an RFP, request for proposal, versus, say, an RFQ, which is just a request for quotes. Yeah, I can speak briefly about that. I'll try to be brief. Um, so for instance, um, the mammography project that I'm talking about that we're working on right now is an RFP um, request for proposal because we want um, proponents to tell us what solutions they have to the unique challenges we have. So the way the document is formatted is this is the situation, this is what we have, this is what we wanna do. And then we leave it open for vendors to bid. And these are huge um, documents that we have to go through with our procurement division. Um, and it's a longer exercise. Um, and uh, we typically would do that with large capital uh, procurements. So like physiological monitoring systems um, and, and, and mammography systems. If it's a small, so for instance, if we have a standard in the territory already, um, that's when we would go with an RFQ. So a request for quotation, which is we know what we want. We know um, what the specs are. So we put that in the document. So specifications actually go into the procurement document and we ask for bidders to provide us that particular equipment. So 
it can be straight from the manufacturer, it can be from other third party um, suppliers, but this is what we want, we know what we want. And then an RFT is somewhere between the two where we put down specifications for what we want, uh, technical specifications, but we can ask for equivalents. We can be like, this is what we have in the system. Do you have something similar or do you have something um, the exact same? And uh, there's more room for flexibility on that end. So that's, that's the spectrum. That's how I would explain it. So from an RFQ all the way through to an RFT. Thank you. Very fascinating. Yeah. Um, this is actually for all three of you. I'm, I'm curious. Do you find that your bidders, your proponents are, um, are more or less interested uh, in, say, if you used a, um, a, a turnkey uh, tendering approach where uh, because of the, uh, the difficulty in uh, reaching wherever the place that you need to install, um, you want to engage one as, say, like the overall vendor, and then they have subs below them, rather than dealing with a number of different um, uh, vendors? Or do you like to do that project management yourself, and you'll engage those separate those separate groups? Uh, I, I, you know, I can speak as far as none of it's con concerned with it. To be honest with you, Michael, um, some of these larger projects, right, so like CT scanner, x-ray rooms, stuff like that. Um, we've tended to go more in the turnkey package because we just, we just don't have the resources to manage the project properly, to be honest with you, right? So they have me, but I'm stretched in. So there's, you know, there, there, we need to look externally to, to get the project management resources in place. And typically that's found through a turnkey package with those larger uh, type of projects from in none of it anyway. Anna, would you say that's the case in, for us too, for the larger stakes? For more basic items, uh, so the radiant warmers would be an example, we'll often do a kind of collaborative approach with the vendor because there's no way in the world they're going to figure out how to get to Saks Harbor successfully. Or we're going to spend just as much time helping them figure out how to get to the community of Saks Harbor and back. Um, and we found for certain technologies, it's not a bad thing for us to do the install since um, <clears throat> this equipment will often, uh, in the case of say radiant warmers in the community, they're used very little because all mothers go into confinement, but when they're used, they're critical. So they might not be touched again for a year and after warranties expired. So when we do the incoming inspection in those situations, we know the device is good. Whereas if the vendor just says, yeah, yeah, it's good then it could be a problem, right? And the vendor's not going to want to go back to Saks Harbor, which is close to $6,000 worth of travel costs. And they could get stuck there for three or four days. And Matt would have similar examples in his remote community. So we try to find a balance on that. Yeah, I think your uh, fox guard in the hen house uh, uh, comment there is is very germane. <laughs> We are at, thank you very much. Uh, Anna, before uh, before we finish, uh, do, would you like to add to that question? Uh, no, uh, Kevin explained it perfectly. It's about finding the balance and knowing uh, when to ask for a turnkey and when not. Uh, usually, I mean, it sounds good and it's great to have, but practically um, not always possible. Yeah. Fair point, fair point. Um, we have a number of other questions, as we mentioned, uh, in the Q&A, and so we'll make note of those, and uh, we'll work with our panelists to uh, to get uh, uh, answers out. We're at 10, 10 past the hour. I very much thank everyone for joining us, and especially our panelists uh, today. Um, so, hearty thank you to you, and um, we look forward to uh, seeing you in the, new, in the new year. We actually have a... Um, uh, Adil, when is our next uh, webinar? We actually have quite a few that we're, uh, we'll have a very rich um, uh, schedule in, in the new year. Next one is the 13th uh, of December, actually. So there you go. Uh, so even before the new year. Yeah. Excellent. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, thank you for your, your time and attention today. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.